Hi all, back at it again. Friday I got a text from a friend said, hey, what's been going on? No videos been going up. Haven't been sending me my text, so ooh, better get back onto it. No excuses. Hey, John 3.16, very popular one. Even if you don't read the Bible, you've probably heard of this particular one. And it's an awesome, awesome text. One of my favorite writers, she says that if the gospel could be wrapped up in one text, this would be the text to put it down on. Tim Tebow, he wore this in a crucial game in 2012 and it became so popular. People were Googling it all over the shop. Millions of hits of people Googling, what does John 3.16 say? Well, what does it mean? Those words, for God so loved the world, we often think that the so in this particular text is an adverb, you know, similar to you, how people use it for my name, where they say, you know, David is so hot, David is so cool, David is so awesome. None of that is true, and neither is the adverb. That so is, in its original Greek word, is hutos. And this word actually means in like manner, or likewise, or similar to, in comparison to. So we're going to find out, for God, in likewise manner, loved the world, and likewise to what? Whew, let's rewind. Well, there's three stories involved in this um, particular text to contextualize it, because remember I said before, it's important that we look at the context of where this comes from. The immediate context is this. A man in Nicodemus, he's a part of a leadership in the Jewish society, and his curiosity is stirred. He actually finds some interest in Jesus Christ and thinks, I think this dude's legit. So he can't actually tell the other leaders because they might think, hey, you're one of the disciples, you know? So he does it in secret. So at nighttime, he goes off and he sneaks to where Jesus is at and he engages him and says, hey, let's, let's, have, let's have a conversation. Let's have some cocoa and, and check this out. And so he flatters Jesus. He says, hey, Rabbi, you know, I tries to get into this... Um, he you know, tries to flatter Jesus with his greetings and whatnot, but Jesus wants to get straight down to the to the crux of it. He says, you know, you've got to be born again. And then Nicodemus, he wants to enter this theological discussion, similar to some of these things that we do here on campus at Arendelle College, and sometimes us theology students, you want to get our swords out and start fencing, and like, ding, 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 yeah, my sword's better than yours. And Nicodemus wants to do this, but Jesus ain't having any of that. He wants to deal with the element of the heart. He wants to get right to the issue of the matter. He doesn't want to have these theological debates and these theological discussions. And he says, hey, you've got to be, you know, be born of water. And that water element, ooh, that water element, that could, that's another talk altogether. But anyway, let's get on with it. It gets right, and they start talking, and it gets up to verse 14. And if you're looking at a Bible, John 3 and verse 14 says, in the same way that Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, and people lived... Wow, 15, 16, for God in like manner loved the world, just like that. Wow, pray to how, what is that story? Well, let's go to Numbers 21. Numbers 21 is uh, from verse 4 to 8. The people of God, all right, Moses had brought them out of the Exodus, out of Egypt out of slavery. And now the people, they're getting sick of this food that God keeps sending them. They're like, man, we're getting sick of the bread, man. We're, we're bread off in Egypt. How can you do this to us? And they start complaining and whinging. A good thing we don't complain and whinge anymore, right? Sometimes some of us say, we don't, we don't uh, even believe in God. We don't believe uh, anything that he says. But when bad things happen to us, suddenly we're like, you know, God doesn't exist. You know, like God doesn't, why is this happening to me? We start cussing him. And, um, same thing with me, you know, my early, when I remember being a teen and things happened to me, I'm like, I blame God, but never had I talked to him in my whole life. And I'm like, got to find someone to blame, right? Anyway, so in the story, these people are whinging and complaining, they're on their journey, and then it says that, uh, and they're whinging and they're complaining. The Bible says that God sends these serpents. Let me digress real quick, okay? It says God sent these serpents. Uh, previous video I, I did, I talked about a, um, the way the Jewish, ancient Jewish mindset works and the philosophical way that we think, we think along the lines of the Greek philosophy. You know, we have ideas of what is, you know, how we determine what's true and what's false. So we have these, um, we can we can think of ideological things that came from, thank you, Plato. But um, the ancient Jews didn't think that way. Classic example, right? We can say God is love. The ancient Jew will have no idea what you're talking about. Ancient Jews can only believe in the context where it says, my God loves me. That's, that's how they understand things. That's the, that's the Jewish way of thinking. Why I'm saying this is important because they put God, they made God responsible for everything, whether it was good, whether it was bad, whether it was anger, whether it was sad, whether it was happiness, whether it was joy. God was responsible for all these things. They had no problem with it. You know, it's similar to the way um, 
A lot of the Islam faith still think they don't have a problem with God having these attributes, but us, they have these, but influenced by Greek philosophy, God is love. It has to be a, a non violent God. It has to be a love that's so gentle that walks around on eggshells and all these kind of things. We, we fail to understand God in his bigger picture because of our, our mindsets. Anyway, God is responsible for sending the serpents. God is responsible for hardening Pharaoh's heart. God is responsible for Job losing his family, his entire family. And Job even says that uh, God giveth and God taketh away. If you know who Jesus is, and we talked about him being the water of life. In fact, John 3, the following chapter, he, he talks about himself being the water of life because everywhere he goes, right, everywhere he goes, he brings life to places where there was a drought, where there was nothing happening there. John 10, 10 actually says that I come to bring you life and life abundant. And a lot of countries and nations back in those days, they determined where they're going to build a city if there was a river flowing through there because they needed the source of water to ensure that life can carry on to feed the cattle, to feed the plants, that would become their food, to feed the people, they need water to drink. So water was everything, and Jesus refers to himself as water is life. So when you come to understand who Jesus is, he's not a Jesus of division and subtraction, nah. -uh. He's a Jesus of addition and multiplication. In fact, if you look around in creation, everything that he makes, trees, people, um, the animals, they've been made to multiply, to reproduce. Thank God for that, right? Anyway, um, so yeah, in the story, the serpents come and they bite the people and the people get this poison in the system and they start dying. Some of them start dying around, you know, you can imagine the, the, the moaning and the groaning that's happening at this time. People start dying everywhere. And then God says to Moses, hey Moses, make a bronze snake, put it on the pole, post it up, let everyone, and tell everyone that whoever looks at that bronze snake, they will live. Man, that's pretty bizarre. That's pretty bizarre, but I think it, uh, for them and their context and where they lived in their cultural environment, probably wasn't such a bizarre thing. So they do it. And the people that look to the bronze snake, they live. All right, let's go back to our story in John 3, 16. So, for God in like manner loved those Israelites that were dying from a poisonous bite. He loves you the same way. Now, how often have you complained and whinged about this life and thought, man, why me? Why do I keep getting hit? Why do I keep getting these freakish accidents? Why do I keep having these things happening to me? And we learn from this verse that the one simple thing that you need to do is look to Jesus, the only begotten Son. And if you believe in Him, and I'm telling you, man, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, when you spend time getting to know who this person is and you look at how this, this water of life how, how he how he operates and you get to know him on a personal level you'll start to realize something stirring inside of you man you know you may not get the the millions that you ever dreamed of but what's what's millions of dollars when inside you you're dying there's a drought happening inside you you know you want you want to live man i'm telling you man i, I love life because of jesus christ that's that's the plain truth and so let me wrap it up with this you know um <laughs> i got I got Uriah, who's my oldest, and Eden, she's she's five now. And I remember when Uriah was around two, three, you know, just started walking and running and, and whatnot, and uh, at the swimming pools, you know, you just go to the ledge, you have them stand there, and, and uh, you know, I stand about a meter out. Yeah, that's not too far. And I put my hands up, he stands on the ledge, I'm in the water, he's out of the swimming pool, and I'm asking him to jump, jump into my arms. And Uriah, unfortunately, is a lot like me. He's a strategist. He's, he thinks tactfully and he's looking at the water, he's looking at the ledge, he's measuring with his eyes how far, how far I am from him. He, he, he starts thinking, you know, maybe if he crouches, maybe if he crouches, maybe it will, uh, it, will, it will shorten the length of how far away we are from each other. But no, nah, it's not. And it took ages before he would even make a move. Sometimes he would just take off and not jump at all. But Eden, Eden, she was different at that age. She'd look into my eyes. She'd look into my eyes and smile, this big smile. And, and I'd call her and she'll jump. She'll jump. She wouldn't even look at the water, wouldn't even look at the ledge on the swimming pool, look straight at me and jump. Obviously, she trusted me. Now listen, I'm just a human being. Maybe your eyes right. I can't be trusted, really. But Eden, if we could be like that with Jesus, when he says jump, just do it. Where you at today, man? I encourage you. If you don't know Jesus, get to know him. 
life will become so much better. Peace.